Well, we're dealing with a light-hearted topic today, dealing with conflict. You haven't had much of that in your life, had you? Well, don't worry. The older you get, the more you'll discover. We live in a fallen and broken world, and a lot of things can happen to us. But here's what happens. Most people define conflict as someone is making me feel bad. But conflict has mostly to do with how I respond to someone who makes me feel bad. In fact, 90% of friction can be attributed to the wrong tone of voice. Have you ever heard someone say, don't talk to me like that? And immediately, you get this sense of conflict, one with the other. Much of the conflict in our lives can be avoided or minimized if we think carefully about our responses. We saw last week that we live in a fallen world, but just as we can take some steps to reduce anxiety in our lives, we can also take steps to minimize conflict in our lives. And so what I want to do today is with this passage we looked at and a couple other verses, we want to talk about six responses we can make that will help us to minimize conflict in our life. Six responses. Here's the first one. Bless instead of curse. Bless instead of curse. Romans 12, 14 says it. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Many years ago, I was a washing machine mechanic, and I had just gotten the job, and so I was training with another guy in, in the van. He was driving me to different locations, and in the course of conversation, I found out he was a deacon in the church he attended, and I thought that was kind of cool. And then he, we got in, and we talked a little bit, and then he talked about somebody in the church that really upset him and did something. And uh, then he said this comment, he did it to me once, shame on him. But now, if he ever does it again, I've got a plan. And he laid out this plan. And I thought to myself, it doesn't sound very Christian to me. And I asked him, I said, aren't you a deacon in the church? Yes. Well, how can you respond like that as a leader in the church, knowing the scriptures? They talked about something like, let's live in a real world, man. No, the real world is when we are submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we learn how to bring our behavior into his will. And so Proverbs 24, 29 says, Do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. God says, don't say that. Incidentally, if you say that, you'll tend to be upset all the time. And so he tells us very clearly not to do that. In our relationships with others, often what passes for love is a little more than a neat business transaction. Here it is. People are kind to us, so we repay them with equal consideration. When they treat us unjustly, our negative response is really what they asked for, and we give it to them. Everything is so balanced, so fair, so logical, with this eye for eye and tooth for tooth kind of justice. But Christian love never settles for only what is reasonable. It insists on giving mercy as well as justice. It breaks the chain of logical reactions. The word bless in this passage, the word behind that in the Greek means eulogy or eulogize or speak well of. So when someone hurts you and you have that first temptation to strike back, no, no, begin to speak well of the person that caused the pain in your life. General Robert Lee was asked what he thought of a fellow officer in the Confederate Army who had made some derogatory remarks about him. Lee rated him as being a very satisfactory officer. The person who asked the question said, I guess you don't know what he's been saying about you. 
Lee's response was this. I know, answered Lee, but you asked me my opinion of him, not his opinion of me. It's very important that we learn how to do that. If you try hard enough, you can usually find something good about most people. You just have to work at it. But you can do that. There were two people that lived in a town, both of them wealthy, and uh, both of them not very nice people. They'd gotten their wealth through some illegitimate means, they treated people poorly, and they had a very strong reputation in the town as being miserable people. One day, one of the two died, the two brothers, one of the brothers died. The surviving brother goes into the local church to speak to the preacher, and he wants to enlist the service of the preacher for a funeral. Now he knows that the church was growing and the church is raising money for a new building, and he knows that his brother was a scoundrel, but he doesn't want the funeral to represent that per se, so he goes into the preacher and he says, I'd like you to do the funeral, and if you will promise me that in the funeral you will tell everybody my brother was a saint, I will pay for your new sanctuary. Well, this preacher was a very straightforward, honest preacher, and he's thinking about it a moment, and then he says to the guy, okay, I will promise that I will tell everybody at the funeral that your brother was a saint. He said, well, then I'll build your new sanctuary. So the day of the funeral comes, and the preacher stands up. And for the next 10 or 12 minutes, he tells everybody what a scoundrel this man was. And, and, and of course, everybody knew it, and they're sort of shaking, amen, amen, you know, they all knew it. And, and then the wife of the preacher is thinking, what is my husband going to do? He promised this man that he would call his brother a saint. How is he ever going to pull that off? But then at the very end of the message, he says, there is no question that this man did many bad things, but compared to his brother, he's a saint. <laughs> you can do it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, this is Jesus now, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Get a long prayer list. Someone hurts you, someone nags you, someone's always on your case. Pray for those who persecute you. He says in verse 45, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. See, because God commended his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get our act together. He died for us when we were a mess. He says, pray for those so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. When it's a sunny day, the evil people enjoy it just as much as good people. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You have an unjust farmer, his crops still get water from the rain. And then he says in verse 46, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? What makes us different? The word tax collectors indicates unbelievers. What makes us different is the way we respond to people when we have been hurt. And so then he goes on to say in verse 47, And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? What makes you unique? What makes you different? What demonstrates that God is in your heart? Then he says, do not even the Gentiles do the same. See, we should be different in our responses and in our behavior. And it's very important that we understand that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In other words, complete in the way you deal with these kinds of things. Let's not make excuses. Let's say the Spirit of God will enable us to make the right response in a difficult circumstance. Bless instead of curse. Here's the second one. Identify with humanity. Identify with humanity. Notice what it says in 1215. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. 
Now, how can you tell if you have the right attitude towards someone that has offended you or hurt you? Here's a good way. What if that person came into work the next day and said they just inherited a million dollars? How would you feel? What would you think? Or maybe they, they were collecting for the lottery that week and he won. How would you feel? Uh, or would you rejoice with them? That tells you a lot about how your heart works. And the Bible says that we're to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. A church father by the name of Christensen said this, it requires more of a high Christian temper to rejoice with them that rejoice than to weep with them that weep. When somebody that has hurt you and offended you in the past has something wonderful happen to them, how do you feel? That really is an indicator of your heart. George Washington Carver said this, how far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and strong. Because someday in your life, you will have been all of these. John 11.35 gives us an expression of Jesus, of the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Now here he is, he's standing outside of Lazarus' tomb. He knows that he's going to have the stone rolled away. He knows he's going to say, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus is going to get up and he's going to come out. But what is Jesus weeping about? He's weeping about the broken condition of mankind that brought death on them. He's weeping because he sees the agony of Lazarus' sisters weeping at the tomb for their lost brother. He is weeping because he is feeling empathy for the condition of people. And that's what we're called to do. You know, there are some people that hurt us in life that are hurting far more than they even hurt us. And we need to understand that. And he says, weep with those who weep. And the Jew said in verse 36, see how he loved him. And that's how we're called to respond to people in a broken world. So bless instead of curse. And then next, identify with humanity. Let, now the next one is, adjust your opinion of yourself. Adjust your opinion of yourself. Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. What do you think of yourself is a real important thing. What do you think of yourself? Pride is concerned with who is right. Humility is concerned with what is right. And there's a big difference. Somebody wrote, Dear Abby, any of you remember Dear Abby in the papers? Good, I'm glad you do. Didn't date myself too much. Dear Abby, I am 44 and would like to meet a man my age with no bad habits. Signed, Rose. Abby answers, Dear Rose, so would I. So would I. Isn't that the way it is? I mean, uh, and, and so we realize that we're in this broken humanity mess. St. Francis of Assisi was a leader in the early church and a humble man. But one day, the story is told that he was walking down the road with a guy named Brother Leo. And Brother Leo cried out, Brother Francis! Francis says, yes, I am Brother Francis. Be careful, Brother Francis. People say remarkable things about you. Be careful. And St. Francis of Assisi answers his friend, pray that I might succeed in becoming what people think I am. We ought to be walking with a sense of humility and aware of our own frailties. Proverbs 13.10 says, By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. One of the great men of the last century was a man named Andrew Carnegie. He was an industrialist and he had 
uh, led in the steel industry and became, of course, a millionaire many times over, very famous, asked to speak all over the place. But when he died, people found out that he wrote his own epitaph, which is on his grave. Here's what it says. A man who knew how to enlist in his service better men than himself. There's the key. A man who knew how to enlist in his service better men than himself. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but rather it's not thinking of yourself. Your focus is on others. That's what humility is. And that's why he was such a successful individual. Pride will always be the longest distance between two people. And so we need to be very, very careful. William Curry was a famous missionary and uh, had, had, had done so many things. His, his fame spread throughout England and uh, he'd received many honors because of some of the things he did. And one particular time at the zenith of his ministry, there was a, a meal being held in honor of Mr. Curry. And as he's at this meal, seated at the table, an English soldier, sort of a uh, grumpy soldier comes in and he's talking to someone else and he says, wasn't your great Dr. Curry once a shoemaker? Well, Dr. Curry overheard it. And before the other guy could answer him, he said, excuse me, excuse me, no, no, you got it wrong. I wasn't that skilled, I was only a cobbler. See, it's very important that we get a right understanding of who we are. Bless instead of curse. Identify with humanity. Adjust your opinion of yourself. And then next, do what is right. Do what is right. Earlier in Romans 12, 14, we started with bless instead of curse. In Romans chapter 12, verse 17, it says, repay no one evil for evil. But notice this next one. But give thought, give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Think about how you respond and how you respond affects other people. Think carefully before you respond. Think, is my response glorifying to Christ? And that's an important thing. Ramsey MacDonald one time Prime Minister of England, was discussing with another government official the possibility of lasting peace. The latter, an expert on foreign affairs, was unimpressed by the Prime Minister's idealistic viewpoint. He remarked cynically, the desire for peace does not necessarily ensure it. MacDonald admitted this, and he said, that's quite true. But neither does the desire for food satisfy your hunger, but at least it'll get you headed towards a restaurant. And that's what he was trying to do. It says in Romans 12, 18, if possible, if possible, do everything that you can, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And that's our call as Christian people if possible. And I know that in everybody's life, God may have sent somebody just to be a continual tester of your character. And you don't have to return evil for evil, or insult for insult, but God has given you someone to pray for and passionately ask that God would change their heart. But if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Bless instead of curse, Identify with humanity. Adjust your opinion of yourself. Do what is right. Trust the Lord to settle accounts. Trust the Lord. He's aware. He sees. He knows what's happening. Trust him to settle the accounts. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Beloved, never, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Don't take it into your own hands. You will mess it up terribly. Never, never do that, it says. But leave it to the hands 
of the Lord. Now, have you ever felt like doing something to someone that really hurt you? We get these feelings from time to time, much like the weary truck driver that pulled into the local uh, restaurant on the side of the road, and he's been driving, he's tired, he's hungry, and he sits down and the waitress comes and he orders a meal, and he thinks he's just going to have a chance to eat a meal and get back on the road. But right as the meal is being served to him, three men pull up on motorcycles to the restaurant. They look like hell's angels and they're acting a little bit like it. And they walk in and they see this truck driver who's seated there and they think they're going to have a little fun with them. So one goes over and as the hamburger is put in front of him on the plate, one grabs his hamburger and takes a bite out of it. And then another one reaches over and grabs some of his french fries and eats some of those. And the third one grabs his coffee, picks it up, and drinks out of it. The truck driver looks at them, and he doesn't say a word. He just simply gets up, walks over to the cash register, and pays his bill and leaves. Well, the, truck, the bikers sit down at the table, and the waitress comes over to take their order. And they say to the waitress, well, he's not much of a man, is he? And the waitress said, I don't know about that, but he sure isn't much of a truck driver because he ran over three motorcycles on his way out. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like that, don't we? Bless instead of curse. Identify with humanity. Adjust your opinion of yourself. Do what is right. Trust in the Lord to settle accounts. And then last, overcome evil with good. Romans chapter 12, verse 20. To the contrary of what you feel, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, there's a lot of dispute about what that means, but I think one of the things it means is you'll drive him insane. You want to drive somebody insane that annoys you? Be kind to them when they annoy you. Bless them. Pray for them. Look for ways to be a blessing. It will drive them insane. And you'll be amazed how God will use that. Proverbs 16, 7 says it this way, When a man's ways... Please the Lord. He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. When you please the Lord and, and you've got somebody that doesn't like you and they're trying to get under your skin and you pray for them and you treat them kindly, God will set the stage that something will come up and you'll be a blessing to them and their hearts will change. I've seen it happen many times in life. And so if you will please the Lord, even his enemies will be at peace with him. Romans 12, 21 puts it this way. Do not be overcome with evil, but instead, overcome evil with good. Proverbs 10, 12 says it this way. Hatred stirs up strife. You can feel it. Can you feel it when somebody is mad at you, doesn't like you, and, and, and somebody has maybe offended you, and then you're walking around tense all the time, and everybody around you gets tense. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Which offense that you and I commit that Jesus Christ didn't cover on the cross? Love covers all offenses. Someone has said, those who deserve love the least need it the most. Years ago, there was a Christian minister named uh, George Crane. I think he also had a doctorate in psychology or something, but he would write an article in the newspaper every week, and one time he wrote about a woman who came into his office full of hatred toward her husband. I do not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he has hurt me. Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. Go home. Act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. 
Go out of your way to be as kind and considerate and generous as possible. Spare no effort to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. And when you've convinced him of your undying love, then you go in and tell him, you drop the bomb, I am divorcing you. That will really hurt him. Wow, the woman's eyes lit up. That's beautiful, she said. Beautiful. Will he ever be surprised? And she left his office with great enthusiasm. And she was supposed to return the next month, but now time has gone by. It's now two months. And the doctor never hears from her. So he decided to give her a call. Are you ready to go through with divorce? What's up? Divorce? Are you serious? I will never divorce such a wonderful, kind, gracious man. Hmm, what changed? What changed? You see, we don't have to have all this conflict in our lives. We can decide how we respond, even to those that hurt us. And when you respond rightly, our motion turns into emotion, and people sense the well-being that you are sending in their direction. So let's review these six responses that we talked about. Bless instead of curse. Identify with humanity. Adjust your opinion of yourself. Do what is right. Trust in the Lord to settle accounts and overcome evil with good. Now I'm going to give you a little secret about life. Someone hurts you and a thought comes into your mind. Usually, if you do the opposite of what that thought is, you're doing what God wants you to do. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. So when someone hurts you or conflict, and all of a sudden, yeah, I'm going, no, do the opposite, and you will find that 99% of the time, you're right on track with the will of God. And you can learn how to survive in a complicated world with graciousness. Two men who lived in a small village got into a terrible dispute, and they couldn't resolve it. So they decided to talk to the town sage. The first man went to see him and told his story. And the town sage, the town wise man, said, you're absolutely right. He went home, quite content. The next night, the second man went in and told his story to the town sage, and after he heard it, he leans over to him, and he says, you're absolutely right. And he leaves. A moment or two later, the wife of this sage comes up, and he says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, whoa, whoa. His story was totally different than his story. You said he was right, absolutely right, and he was absolutely right. That's impossible. They both can't be absolutely right. And he said to his wife, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Some things are just not worth dying over. And you can eliminate conflict if you will do it God's way. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to be people who express the love of Christ to a broken, dying world. And because we have the Holy Spirit within us, we can do it. May you be glorified in all of our relations. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.